I have Steve Elmore on today. We've been fighting with uh, Zoom issues, microphone issues. We jury rigged this through FaceTime and Zoom, so we'll see how it works out. Hopefully, it will. Uh, we'll be getting some video, and and uh, this will be great. So, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. That's good. You're not working. That's good. I mean, your gallery's open, but it's, clearly, you're you're not working. Do you work, by the way? How many days a week are you working these days? Well, uh, I try to get something useful done, you know, most days. Uh, I do a lot of the work out of the house. Yeah. And uh, I've got a very able gallery director, uh, Carla, who's running the gallery for me. And uh, I, I go in, uh, I don't know, in the late afternoons, probably three or four days a week. Yeah. Sounds like my schedule. That things are, you know, or maybe I go in to sign checks. Mark. Yeah, <laughs> go in and shell out the money. Yeah, I um, get that. But you're open. Are you open six days a week or seven days a week? No, five days a week. We're closed on uh, Sundays and Tuesdays. Okay, all right. And just for our audience that are listening, Steve Elmore's. Do you call it Steve Elmore Galleries or Pottery and Gallery? Or Indian art. Yeah, because it's not just Indian art. You have your own art as well, right? Yeah, I've got a, a, a little contemporary gallery uh, adjoining where I'm showing my own work uh, in uh, terms of the oil paintings and work of other uh, uh, artists in New Mexico. Yeah. And and are you enjoying that, by the way, that part of the gallery? Uh, yeah. Well, I enjoy having the space to exhibit the work because I find that if I don't show the work i don't finish the paintings <laughs> and so you know when you have the pressure of an actual show it makes you do the last you know 15 percent, which is usually what determines whether the painting's any good or not it's easy to finish a painting 60 or 70 percent you know <laughs> it's not it's knowing <laughs> it's hard to complete things yeah no it's well i think one of the hardest things for any artist is knowing when especially when they're first beginning, but is knowing when it's done, right? Yeah, I don't think that's a, in, in any way an absolute process. Even I, I often work on my work for years. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I agree. I don't think it is an absolute yeah. process. I mean, Dixon would work on paintings for four or five years. I know Chanteau Begay has a painting that my, that's in my collection. He worked on like eight years. And, yeah. uh, you know, and I imagine if he hadn't have brought it in, he would might have worked on it another eight. It was just one of those things that was an evolution. Paintings can do that, like literature can do that. You know, even movies. I'm sure when an editor is trying to make a cut of a movie, that it's like just incredibly difficult. They might even finish and go, "No, there's, we got to go back. We're not done." So, well, I think of them as all the same painting. So, pretty much until they somebody takes them away, I'm free to do what I want. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Sometimes even after they take it away, I've, I know of artists who've asked to, they want they want well, to do a few things on their paintings. I've avoided doing that so far. Now, ori originally, and we'll get into this because I want to find out some history. But you were a photographer, right? I mean, you did that as yes. a as a living. In New York City as a freelance photographer. Yeah, that's. I began in travel. I've been living in Italy for two years on the bum, and so and for, and doing photographs. So. I started marketing my the work that I've done in Europe, and then that led to, you know, to getting you know, commissions, and you know, I just went to the International Center of Photography and took some classes, and started getting more technical. And after the, uh, and I did that for about you know eight or nine years. Yeah, I'm gonna. I don't want to go too far down that hole because I really actually want to know a lot about that part, but I don't think we can just jump into it because, you know, I found that understanding the beginnings of somewhere and. And where they come from really adds to why you do what you do and how you do it. And you're, unlike most people, you're like me, you're a native New Mexican. You're from Carlsbad, right? Yes. And that's unusual. There's not a lot of native New Mexicans. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a little, little unusual. I, I, I recently have learned how unusual it is, but I never thought about it very much until recently. But yeah, I mean, I came from a... My father worked in the potash mines, and my mother sold dresses at J.C. Penney's. And uh, it's a very small community where everybody knows you, and uh, it's quite uh, quite an experience. And uh, I uh, 
I was quite rebellious, but I'm quite grateful for my upraising there now. So when was the it first? It to be a very solid foundation. Yeah. Well, you know, Eastern New Mexico will do that for you. Good people, solid people, nice people, yeah. you know, conservative people. Um, what? W- when was the first time you went into Carlsbad Caverns? <laughs> Well, I probably went through, I think there's an automatic tour for all sixth graders. So I was probably in the sixth grade and went on a class tour. I went uh, later with the DMLA group, but then, you know, I ended up, that's how I got through college. They gave preference to local students. So I worked as a ranger there every summer for five summers. And, and then for, you know, another half a year when I was sitting out between graduate and undergraduate, uh, you know, uh, experiences. And so I have quite a connection with the cave. It was really my first inspiration to paint was to work on painting the caverns. And when did you do that? At what age? When I was working there, I would, I guess. No, when you painted it, when you, when you were painting the caverns. I started painting in the late 1990s after I moved here to Santa Fe from New York City. I see. And, the first subject, I really took Clifford Still's abstract landscapes. Yeah. And here, here's a here's a an, uh, a secret or an unknown or a known secret, but John Dupuy, the modernist painter from Taos, explained to me that he visited arches at Canyonlands with Clifford Still, and actually, that's when Clifford Still got his ideas for those huge paintings. Uh, of open field colors with lightning and cracks running through them, which are actually the deserts. Uh, you know, that's that's the Red Rock country. And uh, so I wanted to do the same thing with the caverns. Mm. I wanted to paint that particular style. And so that's kind of what inspired me. That was the sort of the, the point where I leapt into painting uh, from, from photography. Mm. And what kind, I mean, so you when you were a ranger, this is in high school, right? And, and well, by the college years, five five college uh, summers, and then another semester when I was just sitting out. So, uh, you know. And what was that? What did you do? Were you actually inside the caves doing things? Well, it was amazing. But at that time, uh, there was three tours, three guides per tour, and I was either lead guide, rear guide, or. Uh, rambling guide in between and we took tours through the cave we all had keys to the front door to the front gate of the entrance to the cave and uh a lot of the rangers uh uh lived in the rock houses above it and we would explore it at night on our own and just kind of hang out with it the cave is a phenomenal presence to be able to uh to spend a lot of time around yeah how do you think that shaped you i mean that is that is monumental. I mean, you when you see Earth's ability to do something, it really puts in perspective how small and quite insignificant you are. I mean, just from the standpoint of time that it took to make those giant stalagmites and stalagmite. Uh, stalagmite. Well, I, I think my experiences with the cave were transformational on many levels, really, because I used it as a learning, a uh, teaching source. And, uh, I, I took it as a as a living uh, God to to be reverent towards and to study. And uh, it taught me, well, basically, Mark, it taught me that the world consists of light and darkness. And I can remember being in the cave for hours meditating and trying to stand the darkness and then going up and just seeing the moon would be as bright as the sun came out and i just went and it just really broke the world into light and dark for me and i used that in the photography primarily and then later i you know i mean there's a the cave is a is a it's a phenomenal thing and when you i mean it convinced me that the earth itself was alive uh that there was it was a living being and worthy of reverence and study and uh, I don't know, I, <laughs> I haven't thought about it in a very long time because I've sort of integrated, you know, that part into my personality. But when I started painting, I definitely wanted to express, you know, geological uh, themes uh, in, in, a, in, a very, in a very direct way. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I wrote about it quite a bit. Uh, 
and uh, and trying to you know deal with it in in a way that uh, you know it became you know part of who I am. It was the pretty first great teacher that I had coming out of college, which just became itself. And I was hanging out with all these cavers, and they were all determined to find you know new passageway. And uh, I got to go caving with those guys and experience their sort of obsession. I tend to be monomaniacal in my interests. Uh, you know, I tend to be obsessed with one thing for a long time, and then when I'm done, I go on to something else. And I don't know why, but that's just that's my process. But for a long time, I was very obsessed with trying to understand the cave. And um, and uh, you know, you can only take understanding so far, which I didn't think at the time. I thought it would be fully understandable, but it's not. <laughs> I mean, I, I accept all that now. I'm older and wiser. <laughs> Did you find any other openings or anything that were not known? I did get to experience some virgin passageway, but it pinched out so small that I couldn't continue uh, doing it. I'd like to know where it went, but uh, my body wasn't going to fit through that. That's what I meant about it. It became you know, like the, the absoluteness of lightness and dark, but you're actually uh, shoving your body uh, in a zen-like way through stone passageway, you you meet that point where you really can't go any further unless you're going to destroy yourself. You know? Yeah, I did so spelunking you know, one time, yeah, and I remember, you know, it was uh, through some caves in West Virginia, and I remember it was so narrow, and, you know, water was coming through, you know, that you could just just barely get your body through. And it's, a you know, for anybody who would be claustrophobic, just talking about this probably bothers them. But it, I remember that it was a unique sensibility. Uh, and it actually helped me write a book when I wrote Paint by Numbers. I wrote a section that somebody was trapped like that and I could relate to what that felt like having experienced it. And clearly you've experienced, experienced it in the same way. You may not have felt any of that, just the same sense because you were so familiar with being in the caves. Well, I don't think it ever gets to be familiar. And I think that, I don't know, it was just, I needed a really, uh, you know, good practical teacher and, and the cave was there. I was fortunate to have it really. My mom actually so, yeah. visited that cave. She grew up in Western Texas. And when she was a kid in the thirties, they would go in it with uh, candles on their heads. I don't know. The cave is just really, it's a, it's, it's a phenomenon. And I, I really uh, have appreciated because uh, it taught it, And also it, it introduces you to the idea of the infinite, you know, the it's things that really, you know, the mind cannot understand completely, you know, that you, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try to, it just means that, you know, you accept that this is a, it's bigger than you, whatever's going on is much bigger than you. So it becomes related to, religion and spirituality in a way. Don't you find it interesting that of all the subjects and areas that you decided to devote your life to, that of all the things you decided to, to go into, you went into clay, pots, yeah. earth. I mean, is have you thought of that? I mean, that seems well, yeah, more than a coincidence. You know, what is that? You know, cat's cradle, you know, uh, God said to mud, sit up mud. Yeah, I, 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 I think of that, the clay, that we're all clay and we're limited. I mean, we don't last as long as the pot spark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, of course. I mean, it has to do with the earth. It has to do with, I mean, really what happened was after 20 years in New York City, I lost my, my connection to nature. And it was a very conscious thing. It wasn't like... Uh, you know, I'm confused about something. It was like, no, I've lost my connection to nature. And I felt soulless and very empty. And I knew that I had, it didn't matter how successful I was in New York anymore. To the West, I could be in touch with nature. And because uh, I, I have been an avid, you know, hiker and I started in nature photography, really, is in high school. Uh, and uh, anyway, I mean, so after. After that, you know, when you realize that, you have to do something about it. You have to go back and reestablish your connection with nature. And so that's what I did. And that became connected to, you know, the cave and the Southwest. I mean, I'm very proud to be from the Southwest. It's, it made, to me, it's, it's, it's a very special place on the planet for a lot of reasons. And a lot of things that I didn't understand about it as a child and even objected to. 
uh, began to be, you know, it's like when you learn that pain can be pleasure. <laughs> you know, you that this is that this is really what it's about, and uh, if you just sort of find a way to to work with it, you know, your your demons they don't actually they become angels. They they help you with all of this. When you were in um, high school, uh, did you have a sense that you wanted to go into the fine arts, you know, as an artist? What kind of degree did you get in college? Well, my degree at UNM was in English literature and psychology, and my degrees, my master's from UCLA was English literature and art. Uh, and so uh, I just spelled out of a doctorate program there because I thought it would just totally kill me to complete it. And what was that going to be in? Was that in the arts or English? It would be. It would have been. It would have been in Amer in American literature. And what time was that that you went to college? Because that was be kind of at the beginning of the Vietnam War or middle. Where was that? Well, I, I graduated in 1967 from Carlsbad and went to UNM until 1971, and then went to UCLA for a year. Uh, and graduated there in '72. So you avoided. The, you avoided that kind of conflict because you were had a school deferment. I had my student deferment, and I had my, and then later I had a, a decent lottery number. Yeah, what was your number? Do you remember? Uh, two twenty eight, I believe. Isn't that amazing? As as a twenty year old, you can remember two twenty eight. Well, it's a pretty important number. I know. Yeah, no, I know. I wasn't going to have to do this, although I thought at one point of joining anyway, but because uh, I'd read Baylor's, you know, uh, The Naked and the Dead, but uh, a bunch of friends talked me out of it, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> I thought it would be a, just a good, you know, somebody has to go write a war novel. I'm glad it wasn't me, and I'm glad that my own life went in, in different directions, but I was quite naive as a youngster. And you did, so you can, you, and when, how old were you when you were thinking about that? Like 18, 19? 18, freshman. Well, that's what young kids do, right? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm an old Eagle Scout, you know. I was raised with uh, all the American virtues. Right. And you're from a very conservative farming and ranching uh, yes. community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you and I grew up not more than 100 miles apart. I recently had uh, been going through Clovis to visit a friend in Texas. It's quite an interesting little town. Well, we don't want to be associated with Clovis. We're in Portales, so just so we make sure we get that that correct. Okay. All right. <laughs> Though I do know a lot of friends that are in Clovis because people that left Portales go, well, we, we need to go to the big city, and they move over to Clovis. Do you go back and visit? No, not really. Occasionally, I'll go back for like a high school reunion. And I follow, you know, follow people in Facebook to get a sense of still what's going on. I think it's good to have a sense of where your roots are and what happens and how other people think as well. Well, I think that, yeah, I think it's actually, I think that to a degree, that's part of what life is about. It's part of, you know, uh, becoming an adult, this duty with all that, rather than simply ignoring it or uh, pushing it down or simply being bitter about your childhood when you were helpless and, people took advantage of you so when you go to uh you finish college and so your mom works at jc penny's selling dresses and your dad what was he what did he do again he was a journeyman electrician so they he must have reminded, that stood for the international brotherhood and had a little socialist tinge he threatened to kick my ass <laughs> I, I take and it he I, was a rather i take it he was a tough guy yeah, he was a manly man, good, uh, good, good fisherman. Uh, excellent, good, good. He built the house uh, that we grew, I grew up in. I mean, literally laid it brick by brick with me hollering at me to bring the bricks faster. We sent them. Yeah, he was a tough, but a great father, really a great role model. Uh, quiet, not always silent, but you know, he knew when to pick his battles. And he was of that. He, knew when to leave me alone. he was of that World War Two era right yeah yeah he was in the air army air force repaired radios which got him into being the electrician and that was during world war ii yeah 
Yeah, so he was in that. So he had that experience. And my parents moved to Carlsbad in 45 because my dad had been living on a ranch between Roswell and Vaughn before the war. Did he grow up there? No, he grew up in Arkansas, but uh, his father signed a note for someone during the Great Depression and lost his little business, his little general store. So they, you know, took the, uh, you know, the uh, Rapes of Wrath trip from Arkansas to California. And, uh, but they stopped in New Mexico and Texas where they uh, began to work for ranches. Mm. And so that was your father's, your father's father or your father went there? My father's father is the one that, uh, that left Arkansas and brought my dad with him. My dad grew up in the 30s. You know, right there between Roswell and uh, Vaughn. Vaughn. Yeah, there's nothing and there. Was Leonard Sly doing uh, hoedowns in Roswell. Yes. Gordon Rogers as a kid. Very interesting. Yeah, so that tells me a lot. And then your, your, yeah, no, it does. It tells me a lot about what kind of person that is. I know what kind of person that is. Yeah, yeah. Tough guy. Tough, but, tough but guy. Honest, really. You know, somebody that has to really. You know, that's a hard life growing up in that area. Yes. Yeah, it was a hard life. And he didn't have anybody to help him because he was one of 11 children. Wow. So there wasn't any help for anybody, really. It's kind of how raised me that there wasn't much help for, for anybody, so get going. <laughs> and what about your mom? Was she from New Mexico? No, she grew up in uh, Arkansas. My parents married in northern Arkansas around uh, Fentville, Smith. And I still have, and I would go back and visit every summer there in uh, the Arkansas area. And so I, I, I have a, you know, a bit of a southern uh, twang from that and also from the West Texas influence. Yeah, I think, I think it's the West Texas influence the most. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm flat, flat accent. It's I know that accent. I've heard it a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I get it. Uh, I've been down there a lot lately. I'm, trying to, I'm selling my parents' house, landing down there. So I've been or down down there a lot, talking to my. I have cousins down there. I visit. And that area's completely changed, right? Oil and gas, Permian Basin has just exploded. Oh, Carlsbad, no. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, the problem is that nobody has. There's no opposition to anything to any of that, really. I mean, it's just, it's just total extraction. The desert has been pretty much wrecked. Their wildlife is all gone. Yeah, I mean, it's just exploded, right? I mean, what? Is, how big is it now? How big is Carlsbad? Do you know? Oh, well, it went from 30,000 to about 72,000 in the county, which includes Artesia, this double. There are 20 man camps in the desert around Carlsbad and Artesia where people are just living in their RVs and pickups and yeah. trailers. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and it goes through boom and bust cycles. Uh, but, you know, right now, and, you know, a lot of, uh, big, you know, the corporations and the government have moved in with big buildings. And it's a totally different town. The fast food stores have to pay the local teenagers, you know, $13 an hour to work at McDonald's. <laughs> so what did your folks think when you go into literature and arts? They just decided from a very early age to let me choose whatever path that I wanted. Uh, you know, my parents didn't really think that they knew what I should do, and uh, they knew that I was, I, I began, you know, writing as a young person, and uh, so they weren't surprised by it. They were, uh, there was a little, you know, disconnect there, but, uh, you know, uh, I taught, you know, uh, in Northern California for seven years, taught English literature there. And was that directly out of high out of college? Yeah, I went from UCLA to Northern Northern California to teach. Uh, and were you interested in native arts at that time? I mean, I'm sure there was some interest just coming from New Mexico, but... I just accepted the native arts uh, growing up in, uh, you know, in New Mexico, but I didn't really have much consciousness or awareness of it. But, and what happened there specifically, Mark, is that after, you know, I, uh, you know, decamped to Italy for two years and after the teaching, uh, I, I went to, I really just went to every museum that I could in, in Europe. I went, you know, two museums a day, just really trying to drink in the art. 
And so when I left Italy and, and the money ran out and we moved to New York City, and I started going to the art museums there uh, and looking around at art, when I saw uh, the Indian art, particularly the Hopi uh, art, I, it struck me as as art. I didn't have to worry about it. It didn't seem it seemed it seemed like it was modern art to me instantly, and uh, because I've been looking at clay and at uh, you know Paul Clay and Juan Miro and Alexander Calder, who were using some of the same visual uh, aesthetics, and uh, and it just struck me that, and then uh, it all looked totally different to me. The same art I had grown up with, you saw it in a New York context and in a gallery, or like yeah, I was like, oh, this is really great stuff. Yeah, different. You know, and I realized I hadn't really looked at it before. And I started looking at it, and the more I looked at it and started asking about it, the more intriguing it became because I realized that it wasn't just a tourist trinket, you know, from the local Stuckies. Yeah. Uh, and I began to see, you know, great pieces of it, you know, and, I, and uh, so I just kind of slowly got kind of reeled in. And when I saw that there were pieces, uh, you know, on the loose <laughs> in New York City. Uh, this is in the, this would be the late eighties. Uh, it wasn't difficult. I mean, it, it was just fun to find them because you know, at that time, very few people knew what they were, and I was able to buy them pretty reasonably. And then I could bring them back into Santa Fe or into the Mesa shows and resell them to pay for you know my my trips back to the West. And when you were in New York, did you start off? right away doing photography? Uh, no, I did travel because I was writing, uh, doing travel writing for some of the magazines and I was writing fiction and essays, but I this really couldn't work. For me. That process was just too difficult. It wasn't, I couldn't make any, any money. So after about a year and a half, or maybe sooner, I started, I realized I could market all the photographs I'd taken here. So I just went around and started marketing the existing photographs I'd taken in Europe, and then people started offering me, you know, photo shoots, you know, uh, and then I saw, and then I went and got training and started doing technical work, and then I quit. I abandoned the writing and just became a full time photographer. And what kind of things were you doing for photography? Were these like commercial things where you shoot a building or? shoot a wedding kind of thing or were they more artsy kind of deal one wedding i just can't handle weddings there's too much drama for, for yeah, me yeah but uh well in the in the beginning i was uh, doing travel location yeah and if a magazine was going to do an article on newport rhode island uh they would give me a, a chance to go up and photograph you know the the mansions and the interiors in Newport, Rhode Island, and uh, I would go and photograph it. Uh, then I would mainly it was marketing, you know, existing travel destination images that sort of started this. And then in 1985, uh, TWA hired me to do their travel calendar, and they flew me to 13 countries. And wow. I shot about you know 400 rolls of film. Uh, they took 13 images for their calendar, and the rest of the images I put into a stock photo library, which then began to generate an income uh, on a monthly basis on the royalties of the existing images. Is that still up and making money? Uh, no, no, that's all a myth. <laughs> You know, I mean, well, it's a myth because the media demands fresh new images. Got it. So if you have a great image of the Colosseum in Rome and was taken in 1985, they're not going to use that compared to an image that was taken last summer. Yeah. So the images do mostly date out, uh, even though, you know, photography, I mean, uh, one of the problems I had was that photography no longer became a, uh, a trustworthy source after they could digitize it and change it all around it to me it lost a lot of its uh of its power mm. you know that you couldn't trust it anymore it became a, a problem uh, for me uh, I, I don't know i i've gone off a sort of an internal network that i don't really understand it. i don't try to understand it anymore i mean i did i did a lot of work for it when i was young but now i don't I don't, 
I don't have to think about it. <laughs> and did you, know, that I, makes any sense? But uh, no, anyway, I get it. That, that's how it is. That's how it is for me. I mean, I think I suspect most of us are that way. You have a time where you you question a lot of things, and then once you resolve them, then you you move forward just to live your life. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. That's how. It well, otherwise you get stuck, and people do get stuck. Yeah. Well, I've been stuck. I've been stuck many times. And that's and I'm talking about really what I how I maneuvered out of it because at the end of the photography, I mean, I didn't even have to look at the film to know what the image looked like. Mm. And so it, it wasn't interesting anymore. Mm. You'd lost it's the creative edge. You think you that was the creative edge was just gone? Yes. Yeah, I can I, see that. To me, it was. To me, it, uh, well, what happened? Well, around the end of the 80s, the travel industry imploded. And so all the travel work that people were feeding me and that were using the images really came to a grinding halt when, when TWA itself collapsed in mm. 87 or 88. And so then I started shooting more uh, buildings and interior spaces for the architects and the designers. Mm. And I picked up the skill with lights uh, by you know, using lights. Uh, and and I enjoyed the architectural photography, especially the exteriors and, and that and that kind of thing. You know, it's you know you got to go up into helicopters and shoot buildings and figure out when the sunlight was going to hit the building from the side walk to the very top of the building and maybe that's only like 15 minutes in midtown manhattan but you've got to be ready to get your shot and it was i enjoyed all of that but in the end i just started shooting you know conference rooms (laughs) corporations reception rooms and you know i could do about 300 of those uh it you know the money was good but i just that's when i realized i it, it had nothing to do with art anymore or uh, it wasn't creative for me. I didn't find it challenging, and I, and I felt like a, like a dentist. Like I was a great technician. I could filter all of these different lights, uh, and you know, and get a good image. But I, it, it wasn't something that I. The image didn't please me. And, uh, I mean, it did. It, it mean, it was professional, and it made the architects happy. And there was skill in it, but it became too re- repetitive. Yeah. No, I can get it. I understand that. It doesn't matter how skilled skilled you are. You can be extremely skilled and good at your skill set. And if you get bored, which is what you're saying, basically, yeah. you know, it's just no, it's not fun anymore. And it doesn't matter on the money. It doesn't matter on anything. Yeah. You know, it's just like, I can't do this anymore regardless. So at that point, did you start looking for Indian art to maybe make a transition a different job, a way to make a living that would be different than what you were? I mean, how did that happen? Well, I rode two horses at the same time. On the weekends, I would do antique shows and chase material, Indian art, uh, go to the, the auctions in upstate New York or go to uh, uh, you know, estate sales or whatever. And um, during the week, I would do the photography. So for about two or three after I decided that I wanted to leave New York, I realized I had to have a way to do it financially. Yes. And uh, at first, I thought, well, I could just do photo work in uh, in Albuquerque and Santa Fe. But uh, I knew a couple of the shooters here, and they weren't having a very easy time of it financially. Uh, it's it's better now. I mean, all the media stuff is better because there's more work because the world uses more images now but in the uh, in the 90s uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, work for professional photographers other than weddings and bar mitzvahs and that kind of stuff which is fine but it's not what i wanted to do uh and so uh i i just started i don't know i was just obsessed with the with the pottery and, and understanding it and so i, I it wasn't it wasn't it didn't seem like work but I actually i just worked the photography during the week and then I bought and sold the pottery on the weekend and then the, the pottery just kept growing I mean it just it became uh, where I would have to choose whether I wanted to do a photo shoot or whether I wanted to do a, you know an Indian art show in Chicago and, uh, and for a long time I chose the photo shoot I wanted to keep my clients happy and keep them 
you know, keep working it. But then after a while, it's like, well, I'll, I'll probably make more money at the Indian art show. Plus I'll have the chance to acquire some new pieces. And, uh, after this, I did the first Indian art show in 1992, Puck Building in Soho in New York. And, uh, and a lot of the people who are still in the business, you know, Ted Trotta and John Malloy, and, you know, the whole oh. group of people from that area, uh, did that show. And then, you know, there were other, I was just doing the, you know, Stella's Pier shows in New York City and the Coliseum Antique Show. And, uh, you know, you start doing those shows, people, you know, they realize they'll start bringing you stuff or, you know, you start, you know, uh, they were a lot of fun. And uh, I, I was, uh, and so gradually I began to build up more inventory and more clients and more sources, uh, you know, uh, for, for the art. And then, uh, I could bring species that I couldn't sell in New York and trade them people here in the West who had stuff that they hadn't been able to sell, take it back to New York, they could be fresh. Right. And, and uh, you know, so I just sort of started, uh, you know, it, it kind of grew from just a, a hobby and uh, stuff that I was just enjoying uh, because I finally had a little bit of uh, free money. So I, uh, I, I wanted to put it into art. I was, you know, I tried to pre Columbia, but that was way in the African material, it was just way, way too difficult. Way, way too difficult. Do you think it was too yeah. difficult, to ju or it just didn't grab your sensibilities, like something that's from your home state, you know, from where you live, that kind well, of that thing? Well, certainly played a part, but in the beginning, I liked the effigies of uh, the pre-Columbian world, and I liked the African masks, and uh, they were very appealing. But you know, if you're coming home from, you, know, you rented a cab with all your cases of gear. And you tell the guy you like African art and he's from Africa and he stops the taxi cab and opens his trunk. He's got 12 masks in there that he wants to sell you that his brother made in Nigeria. Yeah. I mean, the chances of your being, <laughs> of this, I mean, there's the chances of you're actually getting to know and vet this material, honestly, are not very good. Yeah. It, it, sure again, it. Years. I mean, I think people would say the same thing about what you're doing too. <laughs> they would go, "Oh my God, how do you tell? How do you tell a Hopi pot that looks just like this other old Hopi pot? The same shape, same color, same everything, but this one's from Nampeo, But I can't tell the difference. I think it's. I do think it's the same thing, but uh, you know, I, I believe it comes down to a love and a passion that pushes you to that next level, whatever it is, to get to that expertise. Well, Mark, you know, everybody knows I've taken this all the way too far already, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I've got 30 years of research in on looking at non payable stuff and trying to figure it out. I mean, that's, a, that's kind of a, uh, it's, it's, it's a strange, obsessive thing to do in a way. I mean, it's, it's been wonderful. But it's like, I wouldn't have predicted it. If you'd have told me I was going to do this, I would have thought, you know. Yeah, and why, what was it about Nampeo that made you so compelled that you wanted to do all this research, end up writing a book about her and really becoming, you know, one of the world's experts in that field? What was it about her that really moved you? Well, just the real beauty of the work. The power of the work and the uh, the strength of the work aesthetically. It it seemed to be coming from a unified uh, place, and it was making a, an artistic expression that wasn't being made anywhere else, and still isn't being made anywhere else. And it's as and the more I studied it, the better it got. I mean, the better it became. I mean, I, in in the beginning. Uh, it, it didn't seem that way, but uh, the more I looked at it, the more convinced I was of the authenticity of this and the originality of it. And then, you know, I went to 25 museums to photograph their Hopi pottery collection, and uh, you know, I was stunned that there was lots more of her work in those museums. Uh, so, I, so what I discovered was that there was a huge body of work which had previously not been 
are really attributed to her because of the fragmentary way it had been dispersed into the world and nobody had really got around and connected the dots. But if you did that, I mean, you wouldn't, uh, it's, in some ways it's been quite easy. I mean, the information was there. It was right in front for anybody to do. It's just that nobody had actually gone and actually seen the pieces uh, in the in the metal cabinets in the third, you know, sub basement floor next to the boiler at the University of Pennsylvania. You know, right? I mean, some of these pieces have not been looked at since they were collected. And how many of those pieces would have actual collection history with Nampeo, or did you primarily have to go? through looking and deciding, okay, this is her designs, this is her slip, this is the things that she would do, this is the way the pot would be made, you know, compositionally, you know, wh how much of that is just gut, instinctual, artistic uh, sensibility done in an objective fashion versus here's the provenance? Well, I mean, it becomes that in the end. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, when I talk to her age for me, and she tells me, you know, she molded this pot. It took her 45 minutes. She has muscle memory. She's not having to think about how she molds that pot with her brain. Her muscles have taught her how to do it. And so I see that as similar to, I mean, I've just seen so many pieces by Not Pale that I can tell pretty readily, you know, if, if they're by her or not. But in the beginning, uh, I would say that uh, that there were many pieces that were attributed to her through uh, note cards, uh, notes inside the piece of pottery. Somebody wrote on the bottom. Uh, you know, there was a great rush from all the museums to acquire Native American art at the end of the 19th century. So they sent, you know, expeditions out to buy all the pots, you know. Uh, so, you know, Stevenson shows up at Sunni, he bought, he bought every pot in the village. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and so when, when you have these expeditions, these people, uh, they create uh, specific windows in time for when pieces were collected. And uh, they often would note that pieces were by not pale. And there's enough of them that are really marked in that way that you can create a core that you build out on. So that if you see a piece that's uh, that on a note card, Samuel Barrett collected in 1911 for the Milwaukee Museum, and it has a particular design on it, when that design shows up again on another pot, I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's not illogical to assume that she worked on that pot, especially if the slip and the, and the materials are the same and the patination. So, I mean, you know, I... I try to use about five, you know, criteria, you know, before I determine it. And what I uh, what I'm doing now is I'm actually, you know, the second book I'm doing is I'm trying to create a chronology that anyone can use to actually uh, determine, you know, first if it's by her and in which period it is. So I mean, she uses four different slips. The designs change with the slips. And the forms change so that if you put together the design and the slip and the form, you can slot that in, whether that's from her 1890 you know, transitional period or whether it's from her Sidyaki revival period after that. Uh, the yellowware is last, so everything else precedes the yellowware. And then what I started to see was I put all the all the you know i uh, i put all the pieces together with the similar designs or with the same slip colors and then you see that the designs start to jump from one slip to the next uh and i don't know i mean it's a it became like a giant puzzle that i was just kind of fascinated with because it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because i didn't have any idea that that she was so prolific I didn't have any idea that she was really living and working as a professional potter and supplying the entire village with, you know, uh, flour and sugar and coffee and, you know, socks and boots. And she was, I mean, she get, she made all these spots because she was the, uh, you know, she provided for a huge family, a huge clan in the entire village. And 
if you talk to Rachel about it, you know, she'll just say that everyone in the village came to to, uh, to not bail for whatever they needed. And uh, when she traveled, uh, she would come back laden with a gift for everyone in the village. And uh, so I think, you know, the, the amazing thing is that she started as a tribal uh, person, a tribal craftsman, and then became a great artist on her own. Yeah, well, she was a superstar. I mean, you know, Maynard, yeah. Maynard Dixon brought out Anita Baldwin in 1923 and one of the things that they wanted to do you know and anita baldwin's one of the richest women in the world they wanted to meet nampeo and buy nampeo pots so you know clearly her you know uh, status as an artist as a person of interest was had managed to reach one of the richest people in the world and her house was filled with a bunch of nampeo pots that dixon had helped get from Hubble back in the teens, in 1912, 1913. So, yes, I mean, I think this fits in with your chronology that she was a very important person and clearly would have been making the most money at Hopi, you know, of any, probably of any person, you know, and definitely of any artisan. Well, when she began, there was no cash economy at all. If they'd given her cash, she wouldn't have known what to do with it. Right. So it was all trade for decades. Yeah. But the trade was real. And, uh, you know, she would take her, use a mule-drawn cart to take her pots to Keene's trading post and use the same mule-drawn cart to take home, you know, all these bags that she had traded for, uh, for her family and, and the village. So I think there was a lot of, I think it was just, she took it upon her as her responsibility. But the amazing thing is that, you know, she just kept getting better and better at what she was doing the more she did it, which is a, a normal process. But I don't know, not everybody always gets better and better the way she did. Well, and in some respects, maybe more importantly, is that she passed down that love of what she did and those designs to her, you know, daughters, her granddaughters, her great granddaughters, you know, great grandsons, you know, which are still making pottery, or you know, people like Dexter, who is considered to be, you know, a great master, you know, as well, and others. So, I mean, in some respects, that's as important, if not more, of a legacy, in my opinion, than even what she was doing during her life. Well, she founded the Sidyaki revival art movement and it's still going 140 years later and that is quite an achievement because yeah. most art movements don't last but actually mark i think the entire political pottery art market came from underneath her skirts i mean i think that she the pueblo pottery is what allowed uh traditional pueblo people to stay in the pueblos and live their traditional life I mean, uh, I mean, if there's only 250 people at San Del Alfonso and eight of them are potters in 1900, the potters are keeping everything going in terms of uh, it, the men don't have to enter the cash economy. They don't have to go and work in Santa Fe because of the extra income and the goods from the pottery making. Do you still That's see? I, I still see as I still see Hopi as being really creative and lots of artists making amazing pottery, um, maybe more than some of the other Pueblos. Do you find this to be the case as well? Well, yeah. I mean, they're the last holdout for traditional traditional pottery making. I mean, uh, there's very little, if any, you know, traditional pottery fired at Aqaba or many of the other Pueblos. Uh, and so, I mean, when I was first visiting there in the 80s there were probably 50 potters who were making traditionally the number is greatly reduced uh so we are i mean it is it is it is uh you know it is a harder thing for people to do the young people don't seem to be as, as willing to do the work in it but traditional pottery is still made at hopi in, in good numbers uh, it's been a harder time COVID has really because this the reservation was closed down, so a lot of the potters have, have had a very hard time the last two years. Yeah, and silversmiths and kachina carvers, I think all of them, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, Hopi's, Hopi's a hard place anyway. Yeah. I mean, dry farming is not the road to, to, to wealth in this country. No, but it is to spirituality. Yes, it is. And they, and they have, 
the thing I admire about the Hopis is that you know, they traded the material world for a spiritual life. Like the Amish, the Tibetan uh, you know, Buddhists, they're, they, they're conscious of that. Yes. The choice they, yeah, very much so. So when will the next book come out on Nampeo? Do we have a date? I'm trying to finish it by the end of this year. I, I, I don't know when it'll actually get published. I can't decide. I probably would just self-publish again because it, it's just so difficult to work with the publishers anymore. And uh, so I don't know. I'm working on it daily now and trying to get it done. I'm also uh, trying to do a, a documentary on Not Pale. Uh, I'm working with the Canadian director, Tom Radford, and with Steve Lawrence, uh, Hopi Silversmith, and teacher at IAI. And we're, we've done, uh, we have a little preview we've done, and we're trying to raise money. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. And how are you trying to raise money for that? Is it a Kickstarter, or what's going on? Well, right now, we're approach, we're trying to get you know, some of the large broadcasters, uh, including PBS, interested, and uh, the film distributors, and uh, we'll be doing a Kickstarter campaign later this summer. And we we're in a, in a few uh, film uh, 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 festivals to see, just to try to draw attention. Is there a name to this project that you can share? It's called In Search of Mount Pale. It's just like the first book. Yeah. It's presenting her, her history uh, along with a, con- a good contemporary dive into, uh, you know, contemporary Hopi life. Hmm. Contemporary yeah, meaning, visiting. contemporary meaning now or her life? Yes. Now. Yeah, so we're visiting Rachel, Sami, and Bernina Polanco, and we're you know visiting the petroglyphs with a, a Hopi historian, and uh, you know trying to really uh, you know present her as an American master, which is what you know Don Peo is. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. A phenomenon that is still unknown, really, outside outside the West or in certain certain circles you know you know i didn't know about that you were doing a project on nampeo i agree i think that's an overdue subject matter i think it's an important subject matter you know we think of people like buffalo bill who is the most well-known person in let's say you know the turn of the century 1893 he was the most well-known person in the world but you know i would say that nampeo was right up there as far as native artists being one of the most well-known if not the most well-known Potter at that time, you know, at that turn of the century to, you know, the twenties time frame. We know what's interesting, Mark, is that you find that her work was exhibited in Paris in 1885. It was exhibited at the Madrid World's Fair in 1891 and 92, at the Columbian uh, World Exposition in Chicago in 1892. And then, and then, you know, these collections and, and private collectors came and bought her work specifically and took it back and put it in the museums where it was shown. So it was available. Uh, that style, that aesthetic style, was available for anyone to uh, you know, to see and to be inspired by uh, that early. Uh, and 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 since it is, I mean, I mean, there's some things you can't really account for me. I don't have an example of Picasso seeing Don Pale's work, but we do know that he did go to the Trocadero after being given the African piece and, and he was inspired by that. But he isn't doing that until 1907 and Don Pale was doing these fabulous abstractions, you know, back in the 1880s. Yeah, yeah. They are, I mean, they're inspired by Sid Yaki, but, uh, you know, she takes it, you know, she paints in that style and it becomes totally her style. So, uh, and it was sold in, uh, you know, uh, the native art was sold in the department stores as modern art with paintings and silver and oriental carpets. I mean, all five of the department stores in New York City carried her work. So I don't know, just over the years, I mean, I read, a, I did a whole thing of reading all the trader memoirs, mm-hmm. which took me, took me a couple of years, uh, but so many of the traders have written memoirs of their lives uh, as traders. Uh, and they're fascinating because they give you a totally different view of what their lives were like and what happened. And, uh, you know, I mean, they were so interdependent with the people that they were working with. Uh, and most of the, you know, the cliche, I mean, I tried to go against the cliches of the West, that the East 
has so imposed on us that it's always a violent world of conflict and racism and you know terrible events and uh, you know or that you know whereas there's really there was a lot more going on in the west than that I mean, it wasn't just that there was a lot of good things going on and i think that Pompeo's uh, success story as an artist is a phenomenal you know, I mean, this one little woman, her work ends up going all over the world. Mm -hmm. Her work collected in Berlin and in Oslo. And, uh, I mean, you know, it just goes on and on. And the artists like Maynard Dixon, it's interesting because uh, I've been studying uh, Emory Copta's work. Yeah. Maynard Copta has photographs of Maynard Dixon visiting him. Mm -hmm. And, and, and his an anacopter writes about Major Dixon. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it all ties together. And it's almost like most of the Western artists made some sort of pilgrimage to Hopi at one point or another. It was just it would be like going to you know Kathmandu or Tibet today. I mean, that's what they did to you know to show their battle. Uh, and so I think it's very interesting that that part of history has sort of been dropped. Uh, as we look at the West, and I, I think it's something that, uh, that is, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a very different view of what, of what was going on than just, you know, all the, uh, all the suffering. I mean, there was something going on beyond all of that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Dixon lived with the Hopi for almost six months in 1923. So, yeah, and that's when Copta was there. He was yeah. staying with Copta. They shared the studio. Yep. And, have you seen the photographs? Of, there's one of, of him drawing on a sketch and this little kid looking at him. That, I mean, I, I can't wait to publish them. <laughs> I can't wait <laughs> to see them. They're just such fun I, photographs. I, I can't wait to see them. I've got a couple of Copta's uh, ceramics here as well, or and br well, bronzes, and I know where some, some ceramics are in case you want to use those for your book. So. Well, they're at M&A and at the Herd. Is what I, that's where the foundation left them. Yeah, I have yeah. some, though. In my, oh, okay. in my personal collection. Okay. Yeah. So where do you see our business going? You're kind of coming toward the end of your career, as I am, I guess, in some weird ways. I don't, I don't like to think about that. But, you know, you've been doing this now for as a dealer for over 30 years. So where do you see it? Well, I'm awfully glad that I was buying and selling Native American art, not, you know, cut crystal. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, Native American art has retained its popularity with the public because art fashions come and go. And uh, it seems to me that the Native American art is a permanent fixture in the uh, American culture. I think there will always be a market for it. Uh, and I think that's a, a very, very good thing. I, I think it's becoming more accepted. Uh, I mean, there, you know, there are issues going forward. I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't know how they how they will be resolved. I, I, I've given up trying to predict very much about the future, Mark. I'm just wrong all the time. Uh -huh. uh, and so I just learned that, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, uh, there is, a, you know, some of the, the uh, what I would call the political, uh, you know, backlash that's going on, I think, could be very detrimental uh to the native art native american art business uh we don't know how that's going to play out uh, i'm a little apprehensive about it but at the same time uh what i see is that you know more museums are showing native american art as art i think the museum uh, curators uh, of the east have been confronted is you know you know, are you going to, are you saying these people are not American? Are you saying this is not art? Uh, what are you saying as you continue to exclude them? Uh, I think that that question has been put on the table in a very bold way and that we're now seeing the answer. You know, the Met is showing the Dyker action and, uh, you know, the De Young did the Napeo Sidyaki Revival show, which is still up and very nice. And I think there, I think that that interest will continue to grow as we see, as people just accept it as art, which is what it is. I mean, right? It's, 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 it, I mean, we know that because we've been working with it, and we know, we know what it is. But it's amazing how much uh, uh, colonialism, uh, racism, and sexism have been such huge obstacles to this. Uh, 
But I, I think that those obstacles are coming down. It's going to create a different playing field, but I'm not exactly sure, you know, how that's all going to work out, you know. And I think it's harder. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I just don't know how to play it. You know, I, mean, I don't, because I'm not, I'm an outsider uh, in all of this, so that I don't, uh, I don't have any inroads or insight into how the, you know, the establishment and politics of that will go out, you know. But I, I think it will affect us all. Uh, but I, you know. I guess my big, you, yeah, I was going to say, I think my biggest concern is I want to see more Steve Elmore's that come into the business, you know, that are young, enthusiastic interested in didactics and history and add to the, you know, add to the dialect of, you know, knowledge. I mean, one of the things I, I feel that we as dealers could probably do a better job, not including you because you've done your job, but is to do research to, to, to uh, publish, you know, information and to give the knowledge back that you've learned over 30 years so people have it. Right. And then maybe the next group can go, oh, yeah, I want to do that. Or I find this very interesting. And, you know, they, they're going to see it from a different angle than we are. But, you know, uh, that's a that's a real opportunity, I think, for younger people to be able to come into our business and really make an impact, not only in our world, but also in the native world, you know, and, and promoting indigenous art. Because let's face it, we are promoting and have for 30 years, native arts, you know? Yes. Yeah, and we're promoting it as art. And, yeah. And as American art. Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, and so, yeah, oh no, I'm, I'm very, uh, well, I mean, what I tell the people in this field is still wide open in terms of the art, re the art history research. There, the, not that, there hasn't been that much done, and it's recent history. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I wrote the, the you know the book on the pale on the first part of her life because I realized that without some idea of a narrative of this woman's life, that she, she there's no way to get any kind of attraction for her. I mean, people just want to know about the individual behind the art, and, and if there's no biography, uh, and you know, or if there's a huge chunk of it just not there. You can't really go anywhere. I mean, there's nothing, you know, that's people want, and, and I think that's natural, but I think that that's true of a lot of this. I mean, I don't, I think there's a lot of research to be done. Yes. Uh, in, in American Indian art, that would be very, very rewarding. And I think as it's accepted more widely as art, I think that some of that, are, but there, there are more doctoral, you know, programs in art history, and you know, there are more people doing with the native art, Native American art. I guess it's just the politics of it that, you know, that I'm uncomfortable with. Uh, that, and that's and that's what I see is the real, uh, you know, that's the unpredictable part of it. Yeah, that'll work its way, way out too at some point. Well, I think, well, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, it, I mean because things do go in cycles. So it, it probably will, but it seems like a very, uh, it, that that is what I see. And, and, you know, there's actually even, you know, there's a strong, uh, What's the word for it? Uh, there's a strong trend where really it's Native Americans who don't want to work with with the rest of the culture. They want to keep the culture to themselves. They don't want to share it. They want to make it private. I get that. So there's a, yeah. you know, there's a whole backlash in the community, and some of the uh, political leaders don't want the artists to make art and share it with anybody who's not in, in that group. And I, I think that I find that sort of uh, exclusiveness, you know, uh, it's just very damaging because I think that's, I mean, humankind is our sharing ideas and yeah. uh, trading ideas and borrowing ideas and on and on and on. That's what humans do. That's what we're good at. That's yeah. why we're so far advanced is that we learn from other people. And I think Native art will continue to have a huge amount to teach the rest of the uh, of the culture, uh, I mean, I, I mean, it, it's grounded in something real, right? It's also grounded in, in the it's grounded in the American West, Mark. That's something that you know that makes it appealing to me is that it's coming out of this the place where we are, and so uh, it's not hard to connect it. I mean, you have to do a little work. Yeah, and I'd and I'd like to see more Native American 
individuals go into our profession and buy and sell and deal in the native arts. I think it it's I think it adds, you know, to have them involved in. Well, I am really, but I, at that point, I don't know. They they seem to. Uh, I think it's hard for them to do that. It's hard for anybody to do it, actually. I mean, everybody thinks the business is easy, but actually it's a very difficult business to, to make profitable, you know, month after month after month. Uh, well, I think it's harder yeah. when you do. I think what you what you have done is harder because you've kind of focused in on one area, which is pottery. And um, you deal other things. You have rugs, you have jewelry and things like that, and you have your own paintings as well, and now other people's paintings, but I do, my hats always go off to those individuals like Al Anthony and individuals that have really, Mark Winter, who've selected certain areas and go, okay, I'm just basically dealing in this. Uh, and I do find that to be a harder, just from a business model, a harder thing to do. Maybe from a, uh, a reward aspect, it may be much greater just to go, no, nope, I just do this and I know this and I love this and this is what I'm going to do. But from that aspect, it is harder. I agree. Well, you know, retail is relentless no matter what the hell you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Amen. It just is. Yes. Amen. I, mean, I understand. Kept, yeah. Kept, you know, you've been doing this a long time. You know what it's like. Retail is a, it's a, it's a killer. It can be a struggle. It can be very, yeah, it, re it can be exceptionally rewarding at times, and then there are times that it is uh, can be extremely frustrating. Uh, you almost have to become zen-like in the way that you approach it, you know, and not let certain things bother you. If you do, then it's you know it's it's hard to be a retailer. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, at the same time, I've learned that no one wants to hear the complaints of an Indian trader, so let's just move on. <laughs> well, they don't want to hear the complaints of any art dealer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I understand that, so I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't worry about it. And I'm, I'm doing fine, and I, I intend to do fine. Yeah. I mean, well, I you have a great grow. gallery. Yeah, you're off of Paseo well, del you. Paseo del Peralta. If people are in Santa Fe, I encourage them to go see Steve's gallery because uh, it has. It'll always have some great pots. I go every time I'm in Santa Fe. I go by and look, and often I end up taking something out of the gallery as well. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing your, uh, you know, your thoughts, your views, your life. Anything else you want to share with us before we call it a day? No, I can't think of. I mean, uh, you know, just uh, just hang in there and keep doing what you're doing. I, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to really expose, you know, the rest of the world, of this little world. And, I think it's a good thing, and I think that you know, I don't know. I always feel like when the people, when they, when they get what the art is about, we're really doing a service, uh, you know, to provide them with things that have you know so much uh, integrity and soul. And, uh, and I and I have confidence in that future that it'll be recognized. So, yes, I'm going to. You keep doing yours. Keep buying pots, selling pots. But thank you so much for uh, joining me today, Steve. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to make it to Santa Fe this summer, but maybe in the fall I'll get there and I'll come by and see you. Well, I would appreciate that. And I always enjoy seeing you, Mark. All right. Thank you so much. Steve Elmore. Thank you.